Let's proceed. Uh, the second panel is uh, focused on the European Union. Uh, I think I should a little bit uh, move away from the mic. Uh, as was mentioned on already on a number of occasions, the European Union is facing its defining moment. Some would say make or break, actually, 2016. Skeptics, uh, since my second background is academia or academic backgrounds, of course, skeptics in academia say, you know, we should study not European integration studies, but European disintegration studies. Um, I think this is not the right description. I believe that there is still a lot of optimism in the European Union. I believe that the EU is, as some would call it, incremental power. Of course, it comes slowly. It comes incrementally, it comes gradually, but it, on many occasions, actually comes out of the crisis stronger. Uh, I would even uh, risk to say that it's a still shining city on the hill uh, for many countries who still are willing to join, who are still willing to have a free visa regimes, and even for refugees, because on the one hand, the refugees has showed the weakness of the European Union, at the same time actually has showed also the strengths of the European Union. It is still attractive, appealing place to come and to live and to arrive. Um, but of course, in all of this context, uh, to define the Europeans, or EU's place in global affairs, it's even increasingly and even more important. Uh, I am not original here repeating 2003 European security strategy, which started, Europe has never been so prosperous, so secure, nor so free. The violence of the first half of the 20th century has given way to a period of peace and stability unprecedented in European history. In 2015, the, the communication starts that since 2003, the EU strategic environment has changed radically. While much has been achieved over the last decade, today an arc of instability surrounds the Union. As uh, Karl Bildt said, it's not anymore ring of friends, it's ring of fire. And it's not just ring of fire, it seems the fire is sometimes within the European Union itself. So we are dealing with, as the new strategy says, or the ideas which are evolving around, connected, complex and challenging world. And I stop here to look for the answers already in a very distinguished and excellent panel of excellent speakers. We have uh, Sandra Kalniete, who is a uh, vice uh, chair, woman chair of the European People's Party Group in the European Parliament, also the reporter of the European Parliament on the European Global Strategy. Anke Schmidt-Feldsman, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, also was a visiting fellow here at Latvian Institute of International Affairs and also author of the, the article in the book, and William Webel, uh, Estonian Defense uh, University, and also the associate fellow actually with our institute and also the author. So we have excellent panel, and we immediately start with uh, Madame Kalniete on a global strategy. You are an insider. Please give us some responses. Should we be optimistic? And why actually it's, it is needed, uh, the strategy at the moment for us? Please. Uh, thank you, uh, Andres, and I, I will say that I'm always optimistic, and uh, since I'm 63 years old, so you can just count how many times I went through that wave that European Union is on the verge of breaking, and still we are here, and I believe that we will be uh, strong and uh, existing for years to come. It is true that uh, there has been 12 years since uh, uh, European security strategy has been adopted, and at that time, uh, uh, it largely remains relevant also today. But the uh, world has become more complex and contested. And that's why we need to renew our strategic thinking. Um, European Council uh, uh, High Representative Frederica Megherini and 28 ministers of foreign affairs decided that it, the time came to design a new global 
a strategy of European foreign and security policy. Um, a small team uh, of uh, high commission representative is working on the draft strategy and um, we are expecting that it will be made publicly available uh, before the end of June. Uh, all our member states, including Latvia, is closely associated with the elaboration of that strategy. Of course, in the European Parliament, we also uh, we are willing to contribute to that document, and um, thus uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee currently is preparing a report, and I have that privilege and enormous task to be rapporteur on that strategy. What does it mean to be rapporteur in European Union? You have opportunity to draft a report as you like it, as you see it. And that part is accomplished. A rapor a draft report is now currently translated. And then everyone comes up with a uh, shopping list and tries to introduce via amendments uh, different um, uh, right, left, more radical, less radical um, ideas to that document. So uh, the document which is currently uh, at the work is as I understand. And I will speak about uh, strategy as I see it um, operational. Uh, first of all, I would say that what is important that we clearly and realistically recognize the, the may, some of, of the major changes in our env environment. Um, first of all, I would say that um, we have to acknowledge that there are revisionist powers attempting to redraw borders by force and challenge the rules-based global order. And I'm not speaking only about Russia, which is uh, closer, but also about China and some others. Secondly, uh, we are used to speak about weapons of mass uh, destruction, destruction. I would use of mass, uh, the term mass disruption, which means that the importance of cyber warfare is a completely new space what we should regulate and understand how hybrid warfare works. I heard what, uh, what previous speaker Mr. Kajrotsinch said. I think that West uses the term hybrid warfare because it doesn't imply that there is blood. After two world wars fought, uh, in the previous century uh, for Western politicians and academics, it's extremely difficult to acknowledge that um, there could be necessity uh, to uh, defend our values uh, with the ultimate price. Then, uh, speaking about challenge changes and challenges, there are enormous shifting of demographic and economic balance in the world, which also requires um, uh, adequate re response from European side. China, uh, it's becoming world, world's economic center, and um, demographic gravity is moving towards Africa, which is um, uh, 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 real, real challenge for us. And then a few words about United States uh, rebalancing towards Asia Pacific region uh, where lies their security and trade interests and um, relations in future. Uh, and then a few words about, um, about internal limitations which still um, are here in the Union because we are very reluctant to act as a Union because we ha there is a real lack of political will even to use already existing capabilities and policy instruments which are inscribed in the treaties. Um, and another element what I consider 
uh, as of, of importance is that we have highly inefficient defense, defense expenditure. Uh, we are, um, all member states together, we, uh, our defense budget is around half of US defense budget. The efficiency is from 10 till 15%, uncomparable. Uh, and then there is the most delicate issue, values versus interests. And I know that this is um, something which always creates a lot of movement. I don't see there any contradiction because uh, one of the, the uh, basis of any policy, foreign policy, should be realistic approach. And we uh, should um, be very realistic uh, about our neighborhood, how we uh, cooperate to increase the stability in the neighborhood, not going with the um, uh, uh, ultimate demands which is impossible to accomplish in the current state of affairs. And now I will turn to, to the uh, priorities. What I uh, propose for European uh, Union strategy. Uh, the, the choice always is to have many or few. Um, Together with my colleagues, when we discussed in European People's Party, we stopped on few, and actually three. The first one, what I single out in all its complexity, is defending European states, societies, and values. The second one is the stability of Europe's wider neighborhood, which means neighbors of our neighbors. And then the third, European Union as a strong actor in multipolar world. Few words about the first priority, uh, which is defending European states, societies, and values, which means that we need to increase internal and exter external resilience, uh, our preparedness and capacity to resist various types of attacks, both military and non-military. Uh, in fact, resilience will be one of the key concepts in new strategy, which is elaborated by uh, Frederica Mogherini. And that's why in this context it is important, yeah, I see, that uh, EU increases its um, uh, collaboration with NATO, uh, that uh, those member states which are ready to move ahead in clo closer cooperation in defense and defense procurement do it, and Latvia should be among themselves. Now, a few words about second priority, stabilization of um, a wider neighborhood. Uh, European Union cannot aspire to be a real global player if we are not uh, capable to stabilize our neighbors. It means that we have to increase our military capacity. Uh, then, um, if it's necessary to deploy European soldiers and law enforcement uh, officers in our neighborhood. Uh, and we also have to be, uh, we have to uh, keep our commitments on enlargement, uh, open to new members with whom we already began the process, and we have to uh, increase also cooperation with association, associated countries. And third priority, a strong actor. Um, European Union has a very good experience being a rule maker, which is the basis of multilateral, uh, governance and um, uh, diplomacy and policy. Uh, I will not elaborate on the elements of that, but that is the basic outline of uh, a strategy proposal, which starting from February 
will be under the discussion in the European Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Kalniet, uh, for informative uh, uh, overview and same time really with very concrete uh, uh, recommendations and directions of thought. I would be simplistic and I would ask one follow-up question um, uh, using Henry Kissinger, of course, his famous question of what is the phone number of the European Union? Is there a phone number for the European Union where Americans can call? Is some dynamic in this regard has taken place? Or Certainly is there is, same? Angela Merkel. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you. And with this, actually, you very much uh, make my life even easier for the next questions uh, to my good colleagues, Anke and Villar. And uh, even though I saw that Anke has prepared a very long sheet of uh, different statements, a list of uh, statements and uh, recommendations, I, I think I will be playing a little bit uh, devil's advocate and will be asking more concrete questions. Angela Merkel, 2017. Of course, 2016, since you have also the German background, uh, 2016 is not just crucial for 2016, but I think it's a very important base for 2017. And uh, if I may be provocative and ask, aren't we seeing the trends that we will see Angela Merkel gone and Marine Le Pen arriving? And actually, then we'll be asking the, the questions of the phone number, who is actually to call? How you look at this? So 2016 as the basis for 2017. I'll break the protocol and turn it around a little bit. Uh, as you know, Andres, I often do that. Uh, I actually wanted to uh, first set the record straight that the, it wasn't the European External Action Service that initiated the European Global Strategy Initiative but it was actually Sweden together with Poland and Spain and Italy. And since <laughs> I am representing the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, I did also have to highlight that. And that brings me also to what does that actually mean, uh, Germany's uh, particular role? Because what I want to highlight is that this process for this new European global strategy was initiated long before it was now revitalized. And why are we now seeing the support of Germany, France, and perhaps even Britain, although they don't say it loudly, uh, for a European global strategy that updates the one that says Europe has never been so secure, so prosperous, and so stable? Uh, we are seeing that now because we now have a new opportunity to discuss the really fundamental underlying issues of what it is that the European Union has to come to grips with so that the EU as a global actor can make some progress and actually create, recreate or re-establish that stability and security. And that is where I also see the developments in the different EU member states. Does it matter if it is Angela Merkel, who is the chancellor, or if Sigmar Gabriel is the next chancellor, or Steinmeier, who it may be, the German ambassador here, will possibly have more answers on that. But uh, <laughs> uh, what, what I wanted to focus on, and it does indirectly at least address your question, is that there are two main issues that the European Union has to come to grips with. One, which was already mentioned in the first panel, that there are different assessments of what the threats really are, what the most important threats are, and there are also different assessments of what should be prioritized. Is it migration? Is it Russia? Is it Syria? Is it the whole lot? Is it that Britain may be leaving and Scotland may be joining or Catalonia may be breaking off? which doesn't seem to be the case now. But uh, the fundamental issue I see is on the one hand that the 28 EU member states do not understand each other and have a hard time really understanding what the issues are. 
On the one hand, there is an assessment of the countries here, and I often find myself in that mediating position or in that position of trying to explain to the Germans what perhaps the Swedes and the Baltic states are thinking, trying to explain to the Baltic states why Germany decides this or that, or why the Nordic states, Sweden and Finland, may not want to join NATO. Because I think there is a fundamental issue with misunderstandings and preconceptions of why it is that perhaps Berlin wants to pursue the Nord Stream project and why it is that Poland is against. Is it just about money? Is it about geostrategy? The second point related to that is that I think the deeply problematic issue in the European Union today is to do with its foundation, the internal market liberalization, the common market, because it has led to a deep asymmetry between within the European Union and the third countries outside. And what that means, in particular, if we're taking the energy sector, we have the internal energy market that is liberalized, and we have state-controlled champions at the global level that can get access to the EU internal energy market. We have problems with the sanctions. Are they getting lifted? Will they be continued? Because we have a lot of private companies and private business interests within the European Union and we have a lot of geostrategic interests at the international level. And there is an asymmetry. If we're taking, for example, the Nord Stream project, the next one with pipeline three and four, 50% owned by Europe, 50% owned by Russia, but that is not true because 50% much more under state control on the Russian side. And then we have 50% in private business hands and by different countries and different suppliers. And so my point is that it is very difficult to have a European Union global strategy that does not address the fundamental issues of misunderstandings and misconceptions between what, why different countries propose we have to do something to strengthen internally our, uh, how we deal with the refugee migration crisis. We have to demonstrate solidarity vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, how we deal with Russia. That has to be addressed, but also the bigger picture has to be taken into consideration because the compartmentalization that is a result of the development of the European Union that specific issues are dealt by specific departments that the European Commission, if it's DG Energy or DG Competition, or who has the responsibility, is it the external action service that can develop a strategy, but what about the different other interests that are competing sometimes and creating dilemmas? If the European Union, as a union, and if the 28 member states do not manage to take the broader picture into consideration, then it is very difficult to be strategic and to create stability and security because everything fits together in the bigger picture. It is not just economic interests are not just economic for the rest of the world. Even if in Berlin uh, the Nord Stream project is presented as purely business interests, it's not just business, it's geopolitics, it's transport, it's different countries' interests. And it's also economic interests by state actors and by private actors. And so that has to really be taken into consideration, understanding each other better. And here I want to also highlight that the Latvian president yesterday gave a speech at the Swedish annual security conference. That is the big event in Sweden and has actually done 
some effort, invested some effort in explaining the Baltic perspective to the Swedish audience. And that was very well received and what, that was very important because now there is a greater understanding by the establishment in Stockholm why it is that the Baltic states are concerned about Sweden and Finland not being part of NATO and why it is that the Baltic states continue to be worried about Russia and continue to support Ukraine and that there are a lot of shared interests because the geographic space is shared. So that I just wanted to highlight that the Nordic Baltic cooperation is very important but also taking into consideration Germany and of course also Poland. Thank you. Thank you, Anke. Uh, I would like to ask you a question, but I would not dare, at least right now. Uh, so, uh, but I think we will come back to the questions and um, the responses later on in a session. And with this, uh, uh, I have a good colleague, William Webel, always provocative, always intellectually challenging. And uh, I know that you have your list of statements as well as Anke had, but I would add my question to some extent. Uh, in a continu continuity what uh, Anke already was uh, raising, what about the Baltic countries? What ba Baltic countries should aspire within the uh, new global strategy? What is specifics of the Baltic Baltics in this? Uh, what you would like to emphasize in this regard? But in general, I understand that you have also some thoughts where we are going with the strategy. Please, with that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in recent years, we have had uh, if I would be skeptic, I would say we have had a lot of crisis, but uh, actually we can say we have had a lot of events. Uh, we have had events in Ukraine, events in, with neighborhood policy, and uh, e events with refugees. Uh, why I don't say crisis? Uh, because uh, if we we'll take Europe as a family, it's a, it's a normal part of life that things happen. And, uh, if we take the last one, the refugee question, if we have in Estonia, we had, I think, approximately 200 uh, refugees and 100 ha of them have left already during the nights to some warmer countries. So it is too much to say that it is a crisis. But what has been interesting is uh, how we see the future of Europe because of those events. And here I come to this uh, uh, Hungaro Polish question, I f might say that way. So we have a bright vision, what uh, is usually introduced by optimists. And then we have the elections in Hungary, or we have the elections in Poland. And we have in Estonia also a radical right wing party gaining more support every day. We try not to talk about it, but, uh, and we try to talk about global strategy. But it might happen that next election will also bring not the surprise result, but actually the very practical result. While we are talking about the European global role, maybe the radicals will uh, get the majority and build a fence between Estonia and Latvia uh, on the border. Uh, so, and why I wanted to talk about it was that I think before going global, Europe needs to do, do some homework. And the homework uh, with the people who we call stupid ones because we don't want to remember about those people. We don't want to think about the people who want to have debate why we should have refugees, why we should have gay marriages. We usually talk, tell to those people, shut up, those are not the questions you should debate. But unfortunately, not only in Estonia, but also in Latvia and Germany, the educational system produces those people with thousands or with millions. And if we see what happens in our countries, we see that maybe before going outwards, we need to sit down with our people and once again very slowly and peacefully explain how Europe works. But instead of that, I sense sometimes the wish to go on faster, like we want to have this super cycle that we try to convince those people that you get more subsidies, more money. Don't ask about the democratic debate. I make another example with Poland. Uh, uh, to, uh, nowadays we uh, like uh, doubt about is it a good democracy in Poland if it produces such results. It's not a very good message to Polish people. If you have democratic elections, you have the right to choose in the wrong way, if it is a wrong way at all. What is the European value if you 
uh, say that uh, elections can be wrong in that one, or the same in Hungary. Nations have the right to learn from their mistakes or from their history. And here I come to the next important topic, what we have with the, debated with the Germans quite a lot, that we need to learn a little bit more about our different history, our different understanding of history. Uh, because what is the problem with refugee crisis in, a, in Baltic states or, or in Germany or in France is that when we joined the EU, we felt like we were the orphan which has been found again by German, Frau Merkel maybe or someone else, but it's like we feel the German is like a mother telling us the right ways to do, and we have the ones who need uh, some compensation for the history. And suddenly, the things have changed. We have to contribute. But uh, we also need to negotiate it with each, each other that we have a different history. Maybe when France has a colonial heritage in some way and they want to repair something, then we have a different history. We have opposite colonial heritage with the Soviet Union. And the starting point is not the same. So, uh, and trying to conclude is that we have so far, at least in Baltic states, solved all the debates and questions with the Russian argument. And this is also something what we maybe need to do less. Whatever question we have, we say that we need to do like Europeans want or how Americans want because otherwise they will not support us. Uh, for example, we had some racist question in, in Tallinn uh, concerning American soldiers, and it was said that you know, it's, we need to be more holy than Pope, otherwise the Americans will go away. But you cannot securitize everything with Russia. There are so many questions which you need to negotiate with society. The problem with gay marriages or refugees are not related with Russia. They are related with our people, and we need to actually negotiate uh, those questions inside uh, European society without trying to say that if you don't do this or that, you will not get money, or the Russians will occupy you. So, um, coming to the end. So, if we are European family, and I think we are, so the family has different type of kids and different type of uh, parents, and we need to pay more attention to those uh, starting conditions. We need maybe to learn about each other a bit more. So I heard that the, the grand strategy is already, already in preparation. I'm not that happy about it because uh, I see the tensions growing, and uh, unless you solve the tensions before the global strategy, it might fail. But uh, yeah, I think it's a question for the debate, more or less. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Willard. I think it is a question for debate. And with this, uh, I would like to open the floor for a Q&A session. We have around 20 minutes, uh, so it's very dynamic today. Please raise your hand. Uh, uh, State the person whom you would like to address, and please be as narrow, perhaps, in your question as possible. Uh, uh, Oyars, yes, please, Oyars and Carlis. So let's take the round of questions. Please, let's come from this side. One of the issues that, that was mentioned as one of our European Union's challenges is the refugee crisis. Uh, we knew what the debate was last year, uh, and it was over solidarity, sharing the burden with other European countries, not so much with Northern Africa, but trying to help the Italians, the Greeks, and etc. And after a lot of a very difficult debate, there was a general agreement. But it seemed like then Europe was divided between countries that didn't have a problem with accepting refugees, or even welcomed them, and those who were very concerned or very opposed. That debate seems to have changed over the new year with the events in Germany, Cologne. We see growing opposition in Sweden and elsewhere. Do you see this issue changing this year? Uh, within the EU, within, uh, do you think that the, the nature of the debate's gonna change? Because I think this applies to Europe's attitude, what's its place in the world? Uh, and is Europe a part of the global community or are we trying to protect Europe from the rest of the global community that doesn't share our values. Uh, where are we going with this debate? And are, are, is there a major shift now because of what's happened in Germany and elsewhere in Europe as a result of the refugees? Anyone okay, so can... uh, let's have another one. Carlos, yes, please. 
Tom's. There is uh, another. <laughs> um, just a follow-up question uh, to some extent. Uh, thinking, uh, think, when we think about the European Union as a family, uh, and we think about the European Union integration, um, there was a time um, when we were negotiating constitutional treaty, we were negotiating the Lisbon Treaty, and there were ideas floating around that, well, the integration is not happening that fast because the European Union doesn't have its external uh, goal or external enemy or an external threat or something like this which could hold the, all the countries together. Now we're actually, I'm thinking, we're living in a, in a period when there are multiple threats around. And there's a question, uh, aren't those threats actually uh, not necessarily fulfilling, uh, fulfilling the unifi unifying function, but more of a uh, segregation uh, function? Thank you. Thank you. And Artis was raising hand here, please. And then I come back to the panel. You know, uh, I mentioned uh, that Europe has no borders, that they're open. Uh, one of the, th the arguments that can sway the British to uh, not stay in the European Union is because they're not in Schengen. They have a border and they can protect it. You understand my, the meaning of my word? What about the strategy? Will there be strong words about that the European Union has to be able to protect its external border? Okay, let's come back to the, to the distinguished panelists on a refugee issue, on a family issue, on a others, if I understand you correctly, Fortress Europe issue to some extent protect, per protecting, our, protecting our borders. Uh, please, let's start in reverse order, uh, William, with you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, at least from the Baltic perspective, the refugee crisis, uh, the, the refugees themselves are not the source of crisis. The source of crisis is the way we negotiate it inside the society or how we understand it. And I think there was a lack of communication uh, between the EU and uh, with the national government, a bit in the beginning, at least in Estonia. But the bigger communication failure was between the government and the people. So basically, uh, first we even didn't get uh, precise numbers. Then the numbers started to change. Then the promises started to change. If you want to build a trustworthy relationship in, in the family, you cannot uh, start it by telling the foggy numbers, then unclear if you know from the beginning. So, and in that sense, I'm actually happy that it all started with the refugee crisis because the refugee crisis itself for us is not a problem. Actually, we need those people, and most of them are actually very more than progress oriented who come. They want to be rich and they want to get a beautiful wife from the Baltic states. <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, it's the 100 refugees in Estonia is not the problem. Uh, so, what I wanted to say is that this is a very good way to learn how to communicate inside European family, how the Germans, also the Germans need to learn how to talk with Estonians, not to tell that we are not giving you money anymore if you don't take refugees. It's not the way you do in the family. The way is that you start to understand that maybe we are a little bit more afraid because we had this migrant issue in recent past and we're a little bit sensitive about it. So maybe we can find out solution together. This is my my opinion in that sense, but I hope this topic continues and we can, uh, how to say, we are stronger next year of uh, experiencing what we have experienced. Thank you. Thank okay. uh, I want to connect with that and start with, well, is it now the new period of multiple threats uh, that we're seeing? Is that new or not? Uh, I would argue that it is not new and it also connects with one of the fundamental issues that uh, have to be taken into consideration in developing the European global strategy, which is uh, also an issue that uh, coincidentally was discussed in Stockholm in December as part of the process of developing the European global strategy. And that was an intelligent foreign policy, an intelligent strategy. And the fact that uh, Today, there are a lot of claims that we didn't see this refugee crisis coming. We didn't see the migration flood coming. We didn't see it coming that Russia might annex Crimea. We didn't see it coming that they would invade Ukraine. And we didn't see any of these other things coming in Syria. Well, there were a lot of experts that had the knowledge and the national security services had the knowledge. It is the 
uh, perhaps for the decision makers and also for those developing the global strategy in the end and deciding upon it in Brussels, that it is necessary to listen to the experts and to listen to the experts both at the national level and to then gain a better understanding of why the Baltic states or why Poland or why Italy or Spain are saying the things they are saying. Greece had already and Italy and Spain had said for a long time, we have issues here. This is not sustainable. So I think one of the uh, other issues that is very important, which you also started highlighting is, uh, and here I refer to Latvia specifically, it is important uh, in Riga to have greater self-confidence and to actually explain we are against certain issues because of X, Y, and Z. Because I am feeling there is a development over the last couple of years with the uh, growing importance of Germany, the much more visible importance of the German leadership to trust Berlin to always do the right thing. It's in good hands with Angela Merkel and the German Chancellor is doing her best for everyone. I think it is important that uh, there is greater self-confidence also in the smallest EU member states to stand up and to be critical but to explain also what the problems are. So not just to trust the big countries to do the right thing and to just follow because Berlin has said this, we have to. I'm also hearing that in Stockholm. Well, you know, if Berlin or Paris are in favor of this, we have to do that because we need them for other things. I think it's important to have the open and honest debate and greater self-confidence in the countries that are no longer new member states. I mean, it's 10, 11 years, 12 years soon. So that is very important, I would argue. Thank you, Anke. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a very clear divide between us on, uh, so no, actually I'm isolated. I'm the only one coming from politics. You all are from academic world, which means that you are experts, but I'm the one who has that expertise to trans translate in the language of the decisions. And uh, which is very difficult, and I will uh, get back to what Jean-Claude Juncker said, uh, I think, a few years ago or something like this, that actually, yeah, in the context of Greek crisis, that uh, we all know what are the right decisions. What we don't know, what will be the result of next elections. Uh, and it's not cynical, because uh, um, uh, you just raised the issue about the results of the elections. And I want to remind you that Adolf Hitler came to power through the elections. And it does not mean that everything which is a product of the elections is a true will of people, because he abolished the Constitution. He abolished the, the, the same structure of the German state as it was. And that's why there has to be the um, uh, safeguards in any constitution to prevent violation of constitution of that way. Getting back to refugees, is it um, uh, the, the crisis, is it uh, unifying or segregating? I think it's unifying uh, because uh, after certain hesitation, European Union always is very slow to move because we are many, and those who have uh, five uh, children, you know how difficult it is to negotiate a result which is acceptable for all of family. We are 28, uh, but now uh, there is a proposal on the table how to deal with that refugee crisis, ex including also the strengthening of external borders. And again, not to all that proposal is, all member states, that proposal is acceptable. Uh, there are issues related how to interpret sovereignty. Uh, however, I'm deeply convinced that our highest task is to guarantee security, political stability for our values, inside European Union. The, the, the worth of European Union on the global 
seen is exactly by the capacity to be the most open, most democratic, most human rights respecting part of the world. I visited Germany recently and um, um, we had a very um, uh, long discussions with German politicians. Uh, what I brought back from that, uh, the understanding that even if in Germany not all politicians understand the danger of the stabilization of Germany, we have to understand it and we have to help them to understand it because if Germany uh, goes uh, in radical direction then just imagine how exposed Baltic states will be towards the east. This I see the real danger and then you are speaking about um, that we have to be more insisting and more explaining. We are not following uh, Germany or France blindly. We are following uh, the policy which guarantees security and stability for Baltic states. Thank you. Uh, okay, we still have a last short round of questions. Um, um, here we go, yes, please. Please, the mic. Yeah. And some other questions, if there are. Yes, Ambassador. Mm -hmm. Mr. Webball mentioned uh, the issues in the educational system, and just two weeks ago, two weeks uh, before that, a new old new book came up in Germany. I'm talking about Mein Kampf, and uh, I have a question: Should this book become a part of our educational system? Because as for me, it's a great example why far far right radical movements are should be banned or shouldn't come to the power. Thank you. Okay. The young maximalism is a good thing. Ambassador, please. Thank you very much. I'm Ewa Debska, Polish ambassador. And I must say that Poland has been mentioned many times today in the context that maybe I'm not most happy about. But I just wanted to say that, of course, things happen and change. And apparently, Poles wanted to have this change, what they what they shown during the last elections. So I just have a reflection that since European Union and other organizations that we are a part of are in troubles and have so many challenges from outside and inside, maybe we could have this discussion in a calm and civilized way and I'm also ready to talk about what's happening in Poland and what kind of changes there are because there are countries and people who are happy about that there is no unity in the European Union and maybe media is not the best channel of communication and it's really not nice after democratic elections to be compared to Putin who invaded independent and sovereign country. Thank you very much. I'm at your disposal if you wanted to ask questions about what's going on in Poland. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes, very good. I think we will come back certainly to the Polish discussion for us. Poland is extremely important partner in the region. Of course, we would not like to make those choices in between Germany or Poland. We would like to do it together those decisions and stances. Uh, is there any other question? Uh, if not, I would add my own. I'm in the mood of asking about personalities since you asked about uh, Angela Merkel and Marine Le Pen. I think we didn't mention even the name of Frederica Mogherini. I, I I, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, what, is, what is the role of European Union? Is this because somehow we come back to the intergovernmentalism, that there are countries which are important, countries which are even more important. But what about the EU structures? Do we see any role for the EU structures at the moment? Is a new strategy may give some new life to the EU structures? And for Frederica Migrini, is this Kissingerian reply or question, the reply to the Kissingerian question of what is a phone number? Because basically this is one of the ideas to have a European Union serve for the minister. What is Frederick Mogherini's role in all of this and EU structure role in all of this. Let's come back once more, uh, reverse order, starting from the 
uh, uh, closest neighbors, please. Uh, first, uh, uh, yeah, maybe I answer this uh, Mein Kampf question very shortly. That uh, it's uh, as it was said before, we are uh, scientists, so uh, we are about to debate and also debate uh, not the most uh, positive things, or sometimes which are considered not positive things. But I believe that knowledge is a virtue, and uh, more debate and more knowledge cannot harm. So I'm not a fan of ab ab abolishing some kind of debates, because if you abolish it, it will be underground. And uh, so it's a. I make example in Estonia when we had this uh, questions of refugees. There was also complaint that uh, people who f say that there are different races are racist. It's. Uh, one understanding in the science that there are races or, or they are not, but it's just one view, what you can admit or not, you can support or not, but it's knowledge. Uh, coming back uh, to the next, uh, the European level, this fragmentation, what Andres was mentioning, I, I think fragmentation maybe is a, is a word. It has been going, I think, three, four years even, uh, quite openly, and uh, I also s have spoken with some Italians and uh, like asked them, because we as students are very sensitive that the Italians are very uh, well cooperating with Russians, or at least in mental level they seem to be. So we are uh, sus suspicious about them. And, uh, and I asked, uh, why do you cooperate with the Russians uh, behind our back and we don't feel secure? And they say, oh, why do you fight with Russians all the time? You know, we have such a nice cooperation, we can trade with them, and you spoil all the relations. And then it's understandable, as what I wanted to get is that uh, cooperation should give something in exchange. It's, you, ne you need to get something for that, that you do to cooperation. And my question is, what is the deliverable of what Mogherini can give to the member states? Because they all feel that they have sovereign power to do their foreign policy. And if they hand some of that to uh, EU level, they ask, what is the return gain? What do they get more? And I think, uh, so she, she is all the time playing this game to convince the member states that there is more gains if they cooperate. But of course the member states are different. So I think uh, for some member states, I think Baltic states definitely supporting the EU level uh, foreign policy. But it might be much more complicated with the United Kingdom or Portugal because they don't feel this threat. So I think it's a very complicated game for her, and it's a very uh, diverse game because all the member states have different starting points. But I must admit, I am positively surprised. I, I was expecting, I would say, more negative, uh, because we have this thinking about Italians that they might be pro-Russian bit, but she, I, I think from Estonian point of view, she has managed very well. Thank you, Gilder. Thank you. Uh, yes, what's the personality of the EU? A split personality, perhaps, and uh, a, a very diverse uh, family with probably a lot of divorces and half-siblings. And uh, so, so there's a lot of room for discussions there. I wanted to focus on the EU structures, whether the European Global Strategy process can do anything to bridge the problems there. And I do think in the same way in which uh, the 28 EU member states have to be on board with a European global strategy or a regional and global strategy, and everyone has to get their own house in order, I think it is absolutely crucial that the traditional long-standing historical tensions which still exist after L the Lisbon Treaty reforms and the creation of the European External Action Service, that they have to be managed in a more successful manner. Because what we have seen is that the European External Action Service and the Commission and, uh, well, now between Tusk and Mogherini, before between Ashton and perhaps more the Commission, the Parliament has more powers, that there is still the tug of wars between all of the institutions, which doesn't help when you're on top of that having 28 member states and within each member state a lot of different parties. And uh, so I think the involvement of the European Parliament, but also the European Commission and the External Action Service in the process is absolutely crucial because the member states are on board whatever you do. Uh, but we still see the big tension between the different director generals of the European Commission 
and the external action service that is taken seriously by some, not by others, the European Parliament with more powers that is taken seriously by some, not by others. So internally, the process could do a lot more. And I do wonder how the European Global Strategy is uh, internally managed in that sense. Whether the, what, what is the role of the Commission? Perhaps you can shed some light on that. I'm going to the, the concluding thoughts. Uh, I will conclude the, with Mein, mein Kampf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you touched with that issue something which is extremely important. Each nation, each member state, and we all together, we have to come to reconciliation with our own past. And if Germany is a country which went through a massive process of denazification, and that's why today it is possible for Germany to publish Mein Kampf with many comments. And that is really instruction how not to do. Uh, then if we are speaking about the Bolshevization, it never took place. And that is answer why Italians are not able to understand the point of Swedes or uh, Finns or Balts on, on uh, uh, current uh, uh, Ukrainian situation and uh, also Russia's um, uh, policy. Uh, regarding the European Commission, European Commission in uh, that strat global strategy plays role in that part as it is uh, the dual nature of high representative vice president of European Commission. Uh, and the European external service uh, could be more efficient, but with every year it's becoming more and more efficient because Lady Ashton she put the structure in place. Now that structure is becoming knowledgeable and uh, operational. Uh, however, I'm not so optimistic about member states always being on the board. They are not at all. When finally Parliament passed passenger di uh, data um, register, uh, the uh, Home Affairs Council, Ministers of Interior, they refuse to have common European databases based on, uh, on perpetrators and terrorists and so on. They preferred to create 28 different datas. Just imagine, Commission is four, European Parliament is four, Council is the one which hesitates the most. The same applies also to the issues of strengthening of the external border. Council is the one who hesitates. Proposal coming from Commission is a strong one and support of European Parliament except few group, political groups is a very strong one. And to conclude, however, I have very optimistic opinion because we have no other choice, neither Great Britain. And Cameroon yesterday said it very explicitly. He will go even for Erzad's deal, just to keep Great Britain in. Uh, as to the Poland, Poland is one of the most important, our strategic partners, and we really uh, following, we are following the events in Poland with great and deep interest and we believe in your future, you will manage. And uh, uh, you will find the median line between uh, different political tensions which are proper to any country. And to conclude, I would, would, would like to uh, thank everybody, my partners on the panel, um, Anders Sprouts for organizing this discussion. I think it's good that we can speak about foreign uh, policy, which is not of great concern for majority of our citizens, because they are not conscious how much foreign policy influences every day life and every decision. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Gornet. After your uh, concluding remarks, actually, it's very easy for me also to conclude and to say that I believe it was enriching afternoon uh, with uh, some diverse food, of, uh, food for thought, uh, uh, with some responses. Uh, some responses and some replies you can also find in a book. Certainly, we will continue with focusing on more specific, specific subjects as well. Poland, we gladly would organize something. Uh, in a two days' time, we have a debate on transatlantic relations and U.S. role and connection between the European Union and also the U.S., uh, and everybody is invited. And uh, if I have to conclude uh, and give some, some final touch on this one, I'm a little bit pessimistic on the vision side. Uh, I think it is not a high season for really huge break through visions, as also it was mentioned here. We have to solve our own tensions inside. But I think it's a time for resilience, as you mentioned. Societal resilience, institutional resilience, and also external resilience, and these things are absolutely connected. Intellectual. And intellectual resilience, thank you. Uh, so when the in interconnection between policy makers, and we somehow believe also policy shapers uh, in the, the scientific community, with this, I am also thank you uh, uh, to the audience uh, for coming in such a large numbers and, and participating uh, in our debates. I am thankful to our uh, participants here on the panel and also in the previous panel uh, to the authors. And it would be impossible without the, our partnership with our generous supporters already for a long time. Uh, which already I mentioned is this time very bipartisan. And this is actually the good example of bipartisan cooperation uh, of the different ideological streams. Um, thank you so much. And, uh, and if I may, I would also thank you to my, thanks to my colleagues for organizing this, uh, because this has been some job to, to do. Thank you so much, and please, uh, coffee is served.